guys, I'm Dr. Mac Yeller. I'm here with Donald Korb, I'd say the problem solver in eye care and um, really just an entre entrepreneur by necessity, tremendous background. Tell me about kind of your background and where we're going and heading in 2018 as a profession. Boy, what a question that is, Matt, all in one second. <laughs> well, you know, in, in thinking about it, I was very fortunate because I came into optometry in a time when contact lenses were just coming up. Mm -hmm. And I really became passionately interested in contact lenses. And contact lenses had so many problems. Yeah. And, and somehow or another, my passion led me to attempting to figure out how one could have a better contact lens. So that's probably how I spent the first 15 years of my career, really just chasing down the basic physiological processes that inhibited uh, having real success with contact lenses. So for those that don't know you, tell me about your background a little bit and some of those innovations and problems that you did solve. Well, my background is I graduated up time at the school. I took some graduate work. I wasn't particularly happy as a graduate student. I had a great opportunity to succeed my professor um, at optometry school who was the first man in New England to fit contact lenses. So wow. all of a sudden I was in a practice with tons of contact lens patients and tons of problems. So I really had an ample farm, just like a farm of patients with all of these problems. Yeah. So I set myself upon trying to understand them one at a time. And the first one that I really tackled was the fact that they couldn't wear them long. Their eyes burn, their eyes sting, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of that, I developed a technique uh, of, of allowing a clinician for the first time to actually see edema with the contact lens. And that, in retrospect, and as my friends at Duke Cal Berkeley tell me, that changed the field. Wow. Because it provided clear evidence that that's the area that we should be going in. So that area uh, uh, was very productive and allowed us to fit contact lenses much better Right. And one of the areas that we utilized in those days was fenestrations in a lens. And as simple as it is, by drilling a hole through a contact lens of the right diameter in the right place, you could let oxygen through. Yep. And what was happening is we were starving the cornea for oxygen. We needed more oxygen. And by putting holes and other design modifications, we could take people from two and three and four hours to all day wear. It wow. was really remarkable. So that's what was happening at that time. And, and what, what came after that that you were well, involved in? Well, uh, sort of rigid gas permeable lenses. And I really didn't play a great role in that. My friend uh, Leonard Seidner from New York City yep. uh, took up that choice uh, and developed Polycon. And I went off in another branch, and I went off uh, uh, well, I guess it would be really on a mad chase to develop the ultimate soft contact lens. And that led to a lens called CSI, which was the first membrane lens. Wow. And it was 30 microns thick, 40 microns thick. So if you take all of the disposable lenses today fitted in the country, uh, and you'll read the patents from those days, they just follow it. Wow. Yeah, they just fall. So that was the major breakthrough, understanding that you had to have a lens really thin for many, many, many reasons, including oxygen permeability because your decay is a function of the thickness sure. of the contact sure. lens. And you say, sure, but at one time people didn't know that. I had no idea. So this was one of your first big wins, right? Yeah. What came after that? Oh, Seems like goodness. you probably got ahead of steam at that point and really started to go. Oh, my goodness, you're talking so fast and <laughs> I don't know if I can keep up with you. Well. Uh, What was amazing, and what was amazing is that you could put a CSI lens on an individual's eye, and they couldn't feel it. And 80% of them couldn't feel it, they could wear it 24 hours a day and have no problems. And that was actually the birth of the extended wear lens, CSI. Wow. And, uh, well, there was one also in England, to keep the record straight, by my friend John DeKalb. But the two of us invented it within weeks of each other. And the bottom line is that, is that the concept of having a membrane lens just solved a total amount, of, a broad spectrum of problems. And as I said, some people could wear them forever, but, but some individuals, after one and two hours, the lens became progressively more uncomfortable. 
and within a relatively short length of time, it would go from zero feeling, not knowing which eye was wearing the lens, to total intolerance. Mm. And the question was, why? Why? You got it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that this kind of began to merge you into the dry eye space because the two are very commonly shared problems. Tell me about the dry eye space that you entered into. Well, we were uh, we were intrigued by why one individual could wear the lens and the next person uh, could not. And I would examine them and could find no difference. And I had a lot of colleagues in those days, uh, including Dwight Kavanaugh, who was quite famous and actually was chief here at Emory. And uh, we all took a real hard look at, uh, at everything we knew to examine, and we could find no reason. And then, purely by chance, one day, in working with Dwight, uh, he said, have you really looked at the lids? I said, sure, I look at the lids all the time. He said, well, let's look at them together. And we looked at them together, and he said, have you ever squeezed them hard? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, let's squeeze them hard. <laughs> I said, have you? He said, no, but let's do it. So as I remember it, that's how the story started. And when we squeezed them, guess what happened, Matt? Stuff came out. Nothing came Nothing out. Nothing came out. Okay. And we kept applying more and more pressure. And we knew that stuff could come out. Now we're talking about the individuals who couldn't wear the contact lens, not the individuals who could wear the contact lens. I see. So this so, is where entrepreneur by necessity comes in. That's right. So what'd you do about it? Well, we we started a program uh, where uh, a gentleman called Tony Enriquez, who was in Boston, who still remains a very dear friend, and uh, he was a he was a fellow at Claus Dolman, and he was in about a 16th year of training post being an ophthalmologist. He just went on and on with fellowships and fellowships, and he also became a board-certified pathologist. And we sort of teamed up. And uh, I showed him the problem, because by then I had understood the problem, that here we had my booming glints, which looked perfectly normal. Everybody would say they're normal, but they were not functional. So we took a look at them. We did a lot of expression work on them. We did a lot of cytology on them. And we came to an absolutely firm and uncontested opinion that they were obstructed. And then we looked at how they were obstructed. And they were obstructed by desquamated shed, keratinized tissue in which there was a mass of other material right. that would normally be secreted by the mobile glands, including all kinds of mucus, all kinds of oils, etc., yep. beyond description. But the concept was that these glands were obstructed. obstructed. And that's what we did. And then we developed methods of treatment, and we were amazed that warm compresses were a fantastic method of treatment in those days. How'd you stumble on that? Well, because we understood that in order to well, we didn't stumble in that. We reasoned that one out. Sure. And we did a lot of stumbling on the way, but that's not one of the areas we did stumble in. And what we found out was that you could actually melt the obstructive material. So even if you take a Shalazian, and a Shalazian's cut out, you get as much in one lump as you can, so yeah. you can put it on a dish and study its characteristics. When you study its characteristics, it has a melting temperature up in the 50s. Yep much too high. You Celsius. can never treat them. Pardon me? Celsius. Celsius, yeah. So the temperature is way, way up, 140, 150 degrees. You just burn the skin horribly. Oh, wow. But what we found out was that with lesser plugs, with early plugs, <coughs> when you couldn't see that the glands were obstructed, it was quite to the contrary. The material would melt rather readily. I see. In fact, when you express it, if you leave it on the lid margins, and as I'm sure you have done, it melts right in front of you in, 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 into an oily substance. Okay, got it. So, how are we doing? So it sounds like that led to something else. Well, because you're onto something here. It sounds like there was a natural progression to all of this to ultimately make the patient comfortable. And I think we're going to end up coming back to contact lens here in some way. But go ahead, continue. Oh, what I did probably mention along the way is I did mention that uh, this whole investigation 
was motivated by contact lenses. Well, the, the investigation expanded to non-contact lens wearers, and it was exactly the same thing. Got it. So what we knew immediately is that the meibomian gland function was absolutely critical, absolutely critical to contact lens wearing and contact lens success. And we knew then that when we treated these people with lid scrubs and with warm compresses and with expression, and we published each one of these things in a series of articles, uh, you could really, really, really improve the results. So you see something like warm compresses and lid hygiene working, right? And then ultimately that takes goes to the next level, thermal pulsation. How did that evolve? What's that like today? Well, as you, uh, there was a lot of steps along the way, but basically I knew that what we needed, we needed heat. And what I knew is that we had to apply it for a significant length of time. And what I knew is that applying it to the outer surface was limited and we needed a different form of energy to, right. to blast through. Right. So now we're getting into, quotes, bigger time, mm -hmm. financially. So uh, a friend of mine with whom I had been working on another area that we haven't even discussed, which is artificial tears and lipid drops, which I was involved with uh, very seriously for 10 years. Yeah. Um, he suggested, hey, let's get some real money behind us and take your ideas and make them work. So that's what happened. And among the, among the areas that we tested were radio frequency and all of the various methods of applying heat to the outer surface of the lid and, and heating up the meibomian glands, which, as you well know, are in the posterior section of the lid. Correct. So that's where we were at. And we were making progress, and we built what we called a hydrooculator. And for regulatory reasons, we went off uh, to the wonderful uh, island of, of Anguilla, which is a British Virgin Island. And we set up a, a, a clinic there with a colleague of mine who was the only practitioner on the island, Dr. Bodfield. Um, and uh, I had to be licensed, so he got me licensed as a physician because there's no boards of dentistry. Yeah. So now, for the first time in my life, I was a physician. All right. And, uh, uh, and then we tested this device called the hydrooculator. And the hydrooculator was an interesting apparatus in that it provided an entire mask where one could regulate the temperature and it would fit the outer lids on every individual precisely. Wow. And w the treatment was for 30 minutes initially, then we evaluated the progress, and then have needed another 30 minutes. And uh, that could open up the glands, you know, fair. It was, it was better than warm compressors, obviously, but it still wasn't, it still wasn't great. It still wasn't great. We couldn't, uh, uh, across the broad spectrum, we, we were still probably 25, 30% getting really great results, and the results, and the remainder had less than optimal results. So, that led to the next step, which sort of was, uh, uh, sort of happened uh, in a manner which usually doesn't happen. And that is, I was working on an individual with a different type of energy that we would apply from the outside. And all of a sudden, guess what? It worked? No. It failed? No. <laughs> It was modestly successful. <laughs> right in the middle. And I said, we're doing this the wrong way. Okay. We should be applying the heat not through the lid, but where? Posterior. Right. That's how simple. You know, and that brings us back to a saying by the great Pavlov. The simple can always be understood. I'm sure you know this real well. But the simple can always be understood without the complex. Yep. But the complex can never be understood with putting all of the simple component parts in place. Mm -hmm. Then you understand it. Mm -hmm. So, what happened? What happened? I took the instrument, and I had a couple of biomedical engineers with me in the room. And I said, 
can you turn the instrument down to body temperature? And they said, yeah, we can get it down around 35 and a half. Yeah, let's do that. So we did it. Then I spoke with the patient whom I had known for many years, and he was desperate because he was a keratoclonic patient who could no longer wear contact lenses for more than two hours. So he wore them two hours in one eye, mm -hmm. two hours in the other eye, two hours in one eye, went to work an hour early, rested his eyes, lunch, came out in the car, took them off. Oh, he was really guy. battling. He was poor in bad guy. shape. So he was happy to participate in any in any in any study. And we had in those days we could have an IRB which which approved a whole range of treatments provided there was appropriate safeguards, an engineer, et cetera, et cetera. So kept raising the temperature. We kept raising the temperature. And I said, do you feel it? No. And we didn't use an anesthetic. Feel it. Feel it. Oh, it's a little warm. Is it painful? No, it's just warm. And all of a sudden, just as he was about to say, yeah, it's getting there. The meters read 41.6 or 41.7. Bingo! Three of the meibomian glands no look way. like old guys, uh, old faithful. <laughs> Boom! Oh, they just released everything. It was wow. incredible. And we had been working on him for six months and could never get any to open. God. So that was the birth of the. How'd before. you feel at that moment? Oh, it was just unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. So it worked. It worked. Yeah. So this key, the secret, is to heat from the back, yep. not from the front. Yep. So that brings us to today. There's there's a lot of that going on with LipaFlow and some patients really being helped at scale now, not just the one patient who. Yeah. You know. That's that's right. Uh, LipaFlow really uh, uh, really is a uh, a major breakthrough, far more than I I thought uh, it w anything could ever be, because this was a really recalcitrant type of problem, yeah. and no matter what we had done, we never had a we never had a significant result. Uh, you know, it was better than nothing, but to be able to take contact lens patients in a study that has been done, yeah, it, basi it, it basically doubled wearing time from four hours to seven and a half or eight hours. After yeah. treatment. After treatment, wow. yeah, yeah. And you know, and you think of how hard that is with fitting with these individuals. And of course, a contact lens. That's huge. It's huge, it's huge. huge, it's huge. It allows people to wear them socially who couldn't wear them. It allows people to go to the gym who couldn't wear them. And yep. if they were treated multiple times and they did other work, then it would be even better. And in a study that I did with another select group of people, actually, it was even better. It was over 2x. So it went from about three hours to about seven and a half. Uh, but remember, that the contact lens has to have a favorable tear lake to be effective, both for vision, both for comfort. Right. And if you don't have an adequate tear body and you don't have adequate lipid on the outside surface of the lens, every time you blink, what happens? The lid wiper, oh, that was another two years of my life, but the lid wiper Wait, comes right. over and it touches and it gets roughened. Yep. And now you have an abraded sensation. lid wiper and sensation, of course. Mm -hmm. So people are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And if you can keep an adequate protective coating on top of the contact lens, regardless of how it's done. So this expression is so important. Yeah, yeah expression is great. I mean, there's nothing better than having the meibomian glands working with every blink. But you know, you ask, where are we going? Well, when, you know where we are now? We're at a barrier where we have to next change the blink reliably because a high percentage of the millennium population has reached a point where, where the combination of the environment, the combination of the task, the combination of the, of the demands and stress paralyzes blinking and when you paralyze blinking, what do you do? you obstruct the meibomian glands because there isn't the muscle of myelin, which surrounds the meibomian glands, as you know, isn't contracted. And when that isn't contracted, they plug. Mm -hmm. So in retrospect, you know, it's all very simple. Yeah. It's all very simple. I think the thing that's most fascinating to me, while all these innovations happened over so many years, is your mentality the whole time. You relentlessly pursued this, even in the face of probably way more failures than successes and you know still to this day 
you just don't rest. You're just, what's the next thing? How do we get it better? Tell me about that mentality overall and kind of just the way you see the world because that's, what, that's what's made this all happen. You know, that's, that's very insightful because um, some of us do things because we have nothing else to do. So I have a few staff members who come in when they leave and I'm still working on my computer or writing an article or doing a little lab experiment or whatever, they'll say, are we going to do it again tomorrow? And I'll say, well, sure, we're going to do it again tomorrow. What else can we do? <laughs> There's nothing else to do. Yep. So, so as I said when I started, um, if you have something in front of you where you're helping people, where you're gaining a great deal of personal satisfaction, when it's exciting all the time. And then you can walk in the clinic and you can actually see the results of what you're doing. Hey, it's pretty hard to be better. Yep. It's pretty hard to be better. And when it really has an impact, I mean, if something, you know, if you worked in binocular vision, for instance, one of the greatest physicians in the world is a man named David Hunter, MD, PhD. He's head of the Department of Binocular Vision at Children's Hospital. And what he can do he can actually align the eyes while he's operating on them by fixation. And he has adjustable sutures that he's developed in the vet. I mean, it's amazing it's what amazing. he can do. And he can take individuals who are wearing 20, 30 diopters of prism and hit them dead. Yep. I mean, it's incredulous. That's, that's awesome. Incredulous, you know? And I live in awe of it. But that's a relatively small population. But when I think how fortunate I am that the area that I stumbled into because, because I didn't like graduate school and because I was lucky enough to be taken in by my professor and then succeed him and have this great head start, uh, you know, very, 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 very unique and very fortunate. Uh, uh, and, and the stimulation that it provides, I think, is the is, is the real key. So, what's your message for those kind of chasing a goal that is going to take a long time, and ultimately there's going to be a lot of failure? What can they learn from you? Probably not to do it. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's up to the person to make a decision, and I think the decision that one should very, very, very carefully consider is whether you want to spend the time and the energy because there's no way in a 40-hour week or there's no way in a 50-hour week or a 60-hour week you're going to be able to see patients 30 hours a week and do 40 or 50 hours of research and then do all the other reading. Uh, so I think the first question that they have to ask is, how committed are they? And I think it's great if they test it, if they test the grounds. Uh, and if they can be mentored in the lab of somebody who is creative, as I was actually, um, uh, because I didn't even mention, but I had a great experience where I worked at Polarwood Corporation with the great Edwin Land developing color film, and I was in charge for a while of, uh, of, of all ocular and dental photography. So, but just the way they did things just was an example. So I think if you're young, you have to pick out an area that you really like, that you're passionate about, and you just have to pick one thing that you think you could you could make a contribution on. And there's just so many areas that have never been asked. They've been, they're just absolutely endless. They're absolutely endless. For instance, the whole way we test for binocular fatigue, there is no method for testing for binocular fatigue. You practice. Mm -hmm. Do you know a way to test for ocular fatigue? I don't. You don't. Right. But, but, but there are ways that we can start on that road. And there are ways that an individual in his office could do could publish, could get mentoring, and could move forward. So I think you have to pick an area that's reasonable, pick an area that you can get into, uh, and develop the experience. But you've got to have the passion. You've got to have, and if you have the passion, the rest is easy. Well, your passion and motivation is inspiring. Thanks yeah. for coming on. I appreciate it. It's my it. pleasure. Yeah. Great to talk yeah. to you. Thanks.